Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jake Johnson uh, with Johnson Consulting Group out of Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, it's, a, it's definitely an honor to be here today. Uh, at Johnson Consulting, we do uh, many things, accounting, management consulting, surveying, finding loans, and what have you. But uh, we're, we're centered on our brokering, our M&A, our valuations, specifically in the funeral industry. And uh, if, more specifically, our company is involved in helping uh, more recently uh, with the SCI Stewart divestitures and watching uh, private locations buy these businesses back, which is pretty exciting for us. We, we have funeral homes ourselves, just so you know, in Phoenix and in Batesville, where we're from. And uh, from those experiences is what I want to share today, just what we've seen when people are buying these funeral homes, the successes they've had, uh, and then the private funeral homes that sell and buy, what they find out you know, when they get into these funeral homes and how you should look at them and things that can help you you know, with your own succession planning to make your business more valuable, which is, that's always a good thing. And you, for most of us, it's your most valuable asset. And so that's what I want to share today. So I call it buying and selling experiences and uh, what we learned to better manage our business as well. So like I say, when we go through this process, whether the result is somebody buys something or sells it or nothing, there's always good experiences that we learn out of it. All right. So the first thing that I've always seen out of doing this is before you want to decide on whether you want to buy or sell, I got to ask you how well you know your own business. All right. And so we're going to get into that. And then should I buy or sell tips I'm going to give you for successful acquisitions, uh, what to consider for succession plans. I just went through one myself uh, with my father. And uh, so I can share with my experiences on that. And then understanding the value of a customer, which I always like to share, which is a, a great perspective on uh, training and uh, what each call uh, brings from a value for your business, right? So do problems exist out there? Well, of course they do. You know, mix, revenues, market share. I always stop on this slide, seeing if any of you have the employee that's at the foremost front here. I think I might have a couple. I, I would say it in front of them, but you know, personnel can be difficult. Cremation rate, anybody have trends that look like that? You know, more training, lending tightening, increased regulation. There's a lot of things going on. And so, you know, when you consider that and you're considering buying or you're considering selling, you know, my first question going back in this, what the first part of this presentation is going to be is just, again, how well you know your own business. So I always like using this. This is more for my generation, I guess. But, you know, so what you're going to do about the whole thing? All right. So you want to buy. All right. So uh, let's say you want to buy. The, the first question I would ask in, in doing that is, again, how will you know your own business? And better yet, uh, why are you better than your competition and your market? Uh, you know, I hear people say, well, we provide better service. And I would challenge you on whether the family thought, you, you know, they would probably be thinking that anyway. I mean, there's probably some other perspectives on that. And so the question is, why are people coming to you? And this is just a couple slides I want to show you because we do survey customers and uh, in 2013 we surveyed 40,000 families and it, we got a 33 percent return rate and these are some of the things we saw that you can compare to your own surveys that I think is valuable. <clears throat> Might not be surprising but 50 percent said that they were previously served so they came back. That's great. You know, 32 percent the convenience of the location. 27% pre-range, usually we see uh, pre-rangements happening as 25% of the at need volume that's coming in, so that seems to fall right in line. And 28% reputation, uh, we do a, a question where we ask uh, how strongly a customer would recommend a funeral home. That's the wow factor that you hear, uh, that somebody would go out and tell somebody that's never used your business, what a great thing to happen. And so we call that a net promoter score question. And there's actually, if you go on netpromoter.com, there's actually a website by a company, Bain Consulting, and they can tell you how to ask that question. It's very powerful. Anyway, 12% are recommending funeral homes. And then, God bless us, I mean, even myself, I work hard on my website and, and what have you, but only about 1% seem to be coming from the website. Now, that's probably different if you're a direct cremation over the internet type business, but in general, 1%. So 40,000 surveys out there, 30,000 received back. Just so you know how people are finding your business. And it's, again, how well you know your own business and where you're spending those dollars, okay? So the next question, again, you told me you want to buy a business, so these are the first questions I want to ask. How are the people finding you? How about a performance analysis? You know, how many of you have looked at the workplace and done questionnaires with your staff, a financial review of your business? 
uh, customer service and marketplace. So workplace, mar uh, marketplace, uh, customer service, and financial condition. Uh, we call it a performance analysis. There are firms that do that, uh, and it's something you ought to look at. You know, because uh, before you expand, you know, knowing that you're well positioned with your own organization is a valuable tool, and these are things you would do if you bought a place to really figure out what the next step is in a strategic plan. All right. So, how about determining value? And we'll, I'll get into. I'm going to run some models later on to show you kind of how we do this. But you know, the the value. There's revenue multiples. There's uh, uh, dollars on the number of cases you have. The fact of the matter is, uh, all the businesses that we've sold and help people buy are based on this EBITDA number that you hear. And basically, what it is, it's your net income, and you're adding back depreciation, amortization, interest expense on your debt. Taxes and ta not property taxes, uh, in state and federal income taxes, and uh, I think I covered that taxes. So the the reason you're looking at that is because cash flow, uh, this this notion of this EBITDA or this cash flow, what you're trying to figure out is how much debt can your business service if you just clear out all that stuff. And some of that's non-cash expense depreciation. Heck, we use that for taxes, you know, more than anything. And so. I'm going to show you benchmarks on what to look at in your own business later on, okay? So how is looking at your own business, you know, if you uh, the question being how well do you know the value of your business as well? How do you know how the real estate plays into that? What part is your covenant not to compete? What part is the consulting agreement? Uh, you know, employment uh, agreements part of value? They're not typically. All right. No, I don't think they ever are actually. Uh, and then there's a purpose for this value when you're looking at your own business or others. And uh, I even would dare say the IRS is comfortable with knowing this. And that's the fact that there's a value when you're trying to go out to the market. There's a value for the internal transfers. You know, what's the purpose of the value? And so when you go out and ask people, you know, if a son bought it from his father or was, uh, they, bought a build, they bought the business but the building wasn't included, the notion here is that there's a lot of things affecting the value and you really got to have your hands on it and it'd be nice to start with your own business, you know, before you go out and buy others. So uh, selling to an outside party, buying another business, uh, liquidating the business and real estate separately has a separate value. And then a particular interest to most is minority interest where you've got family members involved. Uh, the notion of minority interest really uh, says that uh, if you've got 100% of stock and somebody owns 25% of it and they don't have full control and there's not many people they can sell it to, should it be worth the same as if you had it all together? And the answer is no, typically. It, although there is a crossroads there, you know, because you want to have a happy Christmas. So if you're, you know, if you're going to sell it to your brother or you're going to buy from your brother, you know, it's really kind of up to you. But the IRS does have... Uh, 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 it has indicated that they're willing to accept a discount associated with transferring only partial ownership. All right, for whatever it's worth, it, it does vary. I use 25 to 35 percent at times. You know, it just depends, and it's, it really uh, centers on a primarily um, a lack of control and the lack of interest in, or the majority ownership in a business. So, just to center on that for a second, uh, how many of you budget at your funeral homes annually? Perfect. I mean, we all should budget. One of the things my father says when he does a presentation is he asks if everybody thinks if you, you know, if the successful funeral homes out there are ones that are budgeting and really attuned with their business and everybody agrees. And then he asks why not everybody didn't raise their hand then. You know, so, you know, budgeting is an important thing to do. So the real important about it, thing about it is if you're doing it in your own business, you've now done some training for yourself when you're going to buy another because you've got to create a budget. We've got to figure that cash flow out and doing a budget is how you're going to do it. All right. So how will you know if it's right? Again, I'm going to give you some benchmarks. And then uh, do you have benchmarking available data uh, available, uh, which you will after today. All right. So do you know your own business now? And how often do you review it when you consider those things? And there's many others, of course. And uh, again, the premise being, if you don't know your own business, you know, why would you be considering another necessarily? Because you, you're just taking more, especially of a business you really don't know much about, and trying to meld these things together. And the thing I always ask when I, when I show these things, and these are all learning experiences from watching people buy that have been successful and ones who have not. You know, what if uh, all these things I said your competitor was doing and you're not? And that, that's kind of sobering. It's something you'd want to work on. You know? Or maybe just find out if they are doing it, then you can decide whether you want to do it. But anyway. So 
If you need to better review yourself, what does that say about considering buying another? At least you kind of know yours. You know, buying, again, the cards are stacked against you when you're buying a business. Uh, there's melding cultures, we'll get into that some more. And you need to have a plan in place and you need to be ready. So, you know, looking at your own business first before you go outside, very important, okay? So, when people say, am I ready to buy or sell, I'm not sure what it is I should be doing in time, there, there's an individual that I've worked with uh, that said, he calls it the crystal ball time. And you're looking in the crystal ball and you're looking out five, ten years from now in your business and you're asking yourself some questions. All right, so this is you to trying to figure out, should I buy, sell, should I maintain, what I've got? You know, and so the first question is, you look five or ten years out at your business, you know, how's your case volume look? Is it steady? Do you think it might be lower? I mean, is there, even, is there a notion it might be lower? Is it higher? And then relative to that, your revenues, how, they, how do you think they're gonna look? You know, five to 10, 15 years from now. And then uh, succession in place. Do you have something you're working on? We're gonna get, I'm gonna get into some succession uh, tactics here, but you know, do you have key personnel position today or will you five to 10 years from now? You know, if you have no key personnel in place and you're not sure who's gonna be in place in the future, that would weigh on whether you're buying or selling or maintaining your business. Uh, what kind of life do you want after the deal? You know, what age do you wanna retire? These are all logical things to ask, but you know, if you put this down on a checklist and start answering these things, at the end you might come up with your answer right then and there, all right? So are you leasing a building? The big question here is, at the end of those 10 to 15 years, is that lease still gonna be available? Or are you gonna have to move? Is that a problem you wanna deal with? Is that a problem you wanna give to somebody else? Uh, property location, I like this. The property location, the path of progress, and the functionality of the location. So what I'm saying there is, are you in the path of progress in your town? Are you gonna be on the wrong side of the tracks you know, 10, 15 years from now, or are you gonna be in a great place and it's, and it's stable? And the functionality location, uh, this is a, actually an interesting problem because it should be a good problem to have, but we've helped people sell businesses who have grown to where they're having a difficulty servicing the, the volume out of their location and they need to buy another building, but they were in a town where real estate is tremendously expensive. And so, you know, if, if that is your future, which is a good future to have, are you considering what your options are gonna be and that you'll be able to buy that building or, or add on to your building, what have you. So the functionality location is an interesting one. And then of course your market share trend. We hope 10, 15 years from now it's good, but you know, what's it looking like now and can it be reversed or stabilized? The demographics, mix, mix issues, we're all going through that a little. Uh, top of mind, brand awareness, these are things that uh, for your own business that uh, drive incredible value. When you've got, to, uh, when somebody would go to in a town and ask who the funeral home is and they would say your funeral home's name, that's powerful, that creates value with the businesses that we've sold or help people buy that had that always got good value. Right. Personnel mix, this is always an interesting one and these are all questions you ask yourself and the businesses you look at. But we've looked at businesses where you look at the average age and uh, not only is the owner retiring, but it looks like half the staff is gonna retire you know, in the next five or 10 years. And that personnel mix, what's that say? First of all, if you're gonna buy a business like that, how are you gonna address it? And how about your own business? If somebody's gonna buy it, uh, what, how are you, what are you putting on them to do? And I always say that uh, value is the crossroads of opportunity and risk. And so you wanna have that opportunity. And if the risk is there in the staff, then it, it's, at some point it's gonna affect the value of your firm. And so, you know, figuring out, I'll get into more of that on the uh, p uh, p personnel redundancy, if you will, but uh, multiple, multiple locations. I uh, bought some businesses that uh, had, you know, the first thing was, that, well, they had seven locations. Oh, that, this is going to be a neat business to look at. Well, five of them did, you know, 30 calls or less, and, and uh, the real estate ended up actually being more than the cash flow value being generated. And so I call it uh, economies of scale or scaled down economies. And so uh, we've helped people buy businesses where uh, they, no, the moment they got in there, not, not the moment, but within that year, 12 month period of time after, uh, they closed some businesses down, they got more money out of the real estate than what they paid for it and funded their acquisition really, at least ha half of it. So, you know, 
I would say, selfishly speaking, for all of us that own businesses, you'd probably want to do that yourself before you let somebody else do it out of all your hard work. So, you know, considering how each of those locations are adding value for your own business and the businesses you buy is a very valuable exercise to do, something that we've learned. You know, size of call volume, size of market that you're in, uh, employment agreements for your key staff, uh, covenants already in place, and these are we're running into this with these SCI funeral homes we're selling. You know, some of the buyers are saying, "Hey, you know, this business been owned for a while. Is Joe still under his covenant not to compete? Because I, uh, you know, he's still young enough. If I buy this, he's going to compete against me." And so, securing those former owners uh, and knowing that people would want that out of yourselves, it's really because you bring a lot of value, of course. And so, how those covenants are that are in place, uh, new competition, of course, that would affect uh, value. And then financial markets, you know, it's interesting to, to think of it this way, but uh, there's, the, there's first of all the notion of what, something's worth $2 million, but if going out and borrowing money costs you a lot less to do it, well, you could, you, say you could pay more and still have the same coverage on your debt. And so when the financial markets are good and it's easy to borrow money, you can get more value, you actually can. So it's kind of an interesting thing. So the bottom line, how does your life expectancy look? And you know, there's a lot of questions on these slides, and I'm happy to email all these at the end just so you know that you can answer these things for yourself and kind of ask yourself where you think you're headed. You know? So the big question out of all that, when you think about it, is your business worth more in the future? Is it going to maintain value? Or will it lose value in the future? I hope that, you know, that's the whole thing about uh, the dangerous part about losing value in the future or that, the, you know, that's going to maintain or maybe go down slightly is uh, I equate it like jumping in out of an airplane without a parachute. I mean, you're not going to die when you jump out of the airplane. Just remember that. You know? So, uh, you know, and then what are you doing about it? So, you know, let's, let's address question one and two. We good, had good news, we had good answers to all that, so obviously maybe time for expanding. And I put it real small so now you could see it, but it says it could be a good time to sell too. And I'll, get, I'll address that one real quick. So when you're going to expand your business, there's lots of options, but the two most apparent are starting a new location and buying an existing business. Okay, and uh, when you're going to, let's address the starting a new location. So. The thing that I, I hate to see, because we end up being involved in helping people sell these businesses, is when they don't do a market study, go out and get somebody to tell them, you know, how many calls are in that market, what's the, what's the inclination of the community to be accepting of another location, and uh, I always call it the best money you spend before you spend money, you know. And so if you're going to build a new location, there's companies out there that do it, get a market study. I think it's valuable. I don't know if they range 10, 15,000, something like that. But uh, in contrast to what you would spend, you know, it, don't let it be the beginning of the end of your business because you built too big of a building for the volume that you could get. So we're going to considering the investment value and uh, back in the development cost budget. And this is just a fun little exercise I do to kind of show you if you are going to build a new location, you know, how do you, how, what some ways you can look at that to consider how much is the right amount to spend. All right, I get that question. So I'm going to approach it from two angles. You can see these slides here. One is you want to spend $2 million on a new location, and is that appropriate in that market? And then you're projecting that you have 175 calls, and what's the appropriate amount of money I should spend? All right? Anybody gone through this, building new locations out there? How many have been through this? It's tough. It really is because, you know, it's, it's a great part of having an established business because it's hard to open a new one, <laughs> you know, for your competition. But, you know, being careful about that and, uh, and tactical, like I'm going to show you, just helps you ensure some better successes out of it. So let's assume some things here. So what, the first thing you need to ask yourself, you want to build a new location, of course, is how many calls do you think you can do out of it in the next five or ten years? Okay, and I'm going to use, this wouldn't be the average sale we'd see at our funeral homes in Phoenix, but I'm going to use an average sale of $5,000, okay, and uh, that EBITDA number, that cash number that we want to get to, I'm going to assume 25% is what we're looking for out of this business, that's fair, uh, it could be higher, it could be a little lower, but uh, typically you'd see it higher depending on where you are in the U.S., and I'm going to use a purchase price multiple, you hear these multiples out there, I'm going to use five and a half times for a moment, okay. So, two million, now, now I'm just I'm going to use that information. I'm going to back into some things for you. So, two million on a new location. Well, let's assume that two million. That's the value of what you've spent to put that thing in there. So, let's assume if you had to sell it as a funeral home, which is what you're building it as, that that's the money you'd want back. 
And when you value funeral homes, you use that cash flow number. So two million, we're gonna assume that somebody paid five and a half times that cash flow to get there, right? If you follow me here. And so that you divide that five and a half times into the two million and you get 363,000. Okay, if you follow me. And now, if that's your cash flow, and we're saying that that should be 25% of your revenues, we well, just do some simple math again, divide that again, and now you've got a million four fifty-four. You follow me there? Now we're getting to the revenue here. And then finally, if we know what our average sale is, you take that revenue divided by the average sale, and you're looking at a business, at least in this market, that you would hope you could get to 290 calls if you're gonna spend two million on that building. Right. Now there's a lot of ways to look at this. This, is, uh, this has one angle, the, the other is what's the opportunity cost if that's the, uh, <laughs> there we go. Do we want to update our system? It requires a reboot. Do you want to reboot the computer now? No. How do we do that? Okay, well somebody will figure it out. The, uh, the other thing is, of course, building a new location sometimes has defensive purposes. And uh, so I know that uh, some t you look at this and say, well, I got to build one or I'm going to lose my volume. But I, I, this is just an exercise to do just to be aware of what you're up against at some time in the future you need to sell. All right. So the other way to look at it is going from the call volume side. Then you use all those same parameters and you take the 175 calls times the average sale. You come up with your revenues. You figure from the revenues you want that 25% cash. Okay. And if that's the cash, and we know that we're saying that you, somebody would pay five and a half times that, that we're saying for that 175 calls, you wouldn't, you, know, you start spending more than a million too, now you gotta be careful, okay? Just one way to look at it, it's a f kind of a fun exercise, it's easy, to, you know, it's not as complex as the cash flow, and it's just, when you wanna build a new building, it's just some things to consider. So cash flow, the big thing about cash flow again, you're trying to pay off new debt that currently isn't there. Here's the biggest thing, and this, and this is a trap in succession planning, that uh, you've been operating this business, your, your debt has been long paid off, or it's just not at the relative size of buying a new business. And so you're making decisions accordingly. You've got cash available and what have you. And so if you're gonna buy a new business, or if you're gonna transfer to your son or daughter, or a key employee, you gotta remember they're not gonna have the same cash available because they're probably gonna have more debt than you've got. And so determining just what that cash number becomes real important. Make sense? So figuring out cash flow, and when you're doing the model, you're trying to figure it out under absentee owner status. And what I'm saying is, it would be if we all, all of us owners went to an island and stayed there, which we'd like to do probably, and stay there for a long period of time, can our staff that's there, are we positioned that they could run that business without us? And uh, um, I would hope the answer would actually be no, quite honestly, but the, the notion is at some point, if you're gonna get ready to sell a new buyer, just like yourself, if you were buying a business, you'd wanna make sure that uh, you know, if that person's gonna retire and slow down, they certainly deserve it. You know, they're not gonna work at the same pace after you've paid them for what they've done in the past, you know, that there's people in place there or that, they're, you know, that, you're, that you're starting to groom them, okay? So forecasting revenue. Any questions at this point with a lot of that stuff? It's a, it's a lot of information, but uh, I'm going to have a drink of water while this is. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. Absolutely. Pre need is a big question. So here it is. So we talked about this cash flow modeling. Well, the next question is, hey Jake, well then show us how to how do you kind of model this? What do you how do you do this? How do you do this budgeting or, or how do you guys do it at least? I have it my way. I'd like to know how it's done. So the first thing is of course forecasting revenue. And the reason I say this is because the benchmarking data I'm gonna give you is based on net sales. And if you don't have an accurate net sales, this doesn't work. Okay? And so I I would argue that if you're going to look at sales, you can look at what it says on that P&L, you can look at what it says on the tax return, but if you do a sales contract analysis, you're really going to know. And so as, uh, as, as big of a task as that can be for some firms, uh, you know, I've, I think I've developed carpal tunnel at this point doing sales contract analysis, but you know, flipping through every contract, identifying the case type, uh, whether it was pre-need, turned at need, 
uh, the what the casket cost or the casket uh, retail was, the service, the urn, the vault, all that th all that stuff, and getting your cash advances on the other side of the subtotal line, like you can imagine. I want to know what your net sales are. I don't want those cash advances in there. I want to know what your real sales are. So. Uh, when you're doing that sales contract analysis, that's how you're gonna really understand the sales that you're looking at. And it's sometimes not gonna match because there's that special drawer that some owners have that uh, maybe 10 cases a year go in there and that's the uh, Disney trip with the family or something. It just doesn't fall in those P&Ls. So uh, I'll address that as well. <laughs> So all right, so we got our revenue. So the next uh, bucket is cost of goods. For us, when we're looking at it, we're talking about everything could be a cost, but we're talking about caskets, vaults, urns, markers, and your rebates for your purchases. A benchmark in this category for us across all the valuations, the M&A, accounting, management, client, everything that we've done, it's been about 13 to 19% of net sales. It could be lower in your high, high cremation places and higher in your high, high vault sale places. So it's just a range, okay? Payroll, payroll officers full part-time, your benefits, your contract labor, training expense, uniforms, basically anything associated with having an employee. Right? And the benchmark we see on that is 25 to 35%. All yours will be higher if all your owners are in there if you're paying yourself, which you should be paying yourself. And so what I'm talking about is an owner expense adjusted payroll section, okay? an absentee owner status. What would it look like if you were gone? What would that payroll percentage be? And I would challenge you to look at how you are compared to these ranges. I've worked, at, I've worked in funeral homes as well and done funeral arrangements. And the particular place I worked was that we were at 20% actually. And that was a very high volume place. but. 25, 35% or 30% range is not unusual. Facility, this will be obvious to you, building insurance, liability, telephone, utilities, repair, maintenance, rental, anything associated with having a building in this facility category. I use a benchmark of five to 10%. That does not include rent. So let's talk about that for 30 seconds here. Rent, if you're uh, renting the building, uh, the way we always see them is triple net. That means uh, you're the person, uh, you're the leasee, and you're paying for, the, for everything. You know, the person's just offering you the building to be in. So triple net, and usually we see those rents at seven to 12% of net sales. Okay, anybody have questions on that? Sometimes we do, so, or you rent yourself out of another entity, and so just to give you a perspective there. One thing that's interesting on the rent is that uh, if you are in a very high dollar property value location and your sales don't create a relative rent dollar amount, I would, you know, you might have uh, qu get questions by some taxing authority saying that maybe you're not paying enough rent or they're going to, you know, when you're flowing it through to another entity, they call it a cap rate, but basically, uh, not to get into it too much, but is the rent fair for the value of the real estate? Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Oftentimes it's even more. So because your sales hopefully are pretty good. So vehicles in the vehicle section, two to 5% of net sales. That's what we typically see in our benchmarks. Advertising, donations, yellow, anything associated with advertising, uh, two to 6% of net sales. It are, we have funeral homes in Phoenix, our funeral homes there, it's 8%. We we'll plan to scale back, but it, you know, some of these markets, it's expensive to advertise, you know, and we have a funeral home in Batesville, Indiana, where we're, who we're all familiar with, and that, our advertising budget there is 1%, I think. You know, we just, we know everybody in town, and you can associate yourself with that, so. Where do you see that number going in the next five years? Hmm, I would think it's going down, but, you know, I, when you look at how many people are using the internet still, it's still low, so. Um, God, I mean, how many people are in the yellow pages still? I imagine that's going down for most of us, you know, and finding other ways. So I would think it's going down. At the same time, uh, depending on your market, you know. I'll say one other thing about that, though. What I, uh, my father calls it the, the death spiral to funeral home, and that's where volume uh, slips, and uh, we immediately start trying to make rash decisions to maintain either our lifestyle or just the cash flow in the business for whatever reason. And uh, sad to say, some of the first things we cut are advertising. And then when you do that, you wonder whether that affects your business and you start more of a downward spiral. And you know, so you always wanna be careful on those decisions. And it, it really is a, it calls for the need for budgeting and understanding whether or not uh, it truly is a bad month, if you will, so. 
So why EBITDA? It's the cash available before debt expense. And here's a, a fun thing that I show because it, it gets into banking stuff, which excites me, of course. But there's something that uh, a bank's going to look at called a debt service coverage ratio or fixed charge. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that, uh, and this is if you're buying or uh, somebody's uh, buying your business, they're going to be uh, confronted with this from their bank if they're using a bank. And that's the fact that for every dollar, uh, in fact, so the one, where it says 1.35 times, here's what that means. It means for every dollar 35 in EBITDA or cash at your business, or for every dollar of principal and interest that you're borrowing, that you're having to make payments on, the bank wants to make sure you got a dollar 35. So they want to see 135% over what you got to pay them because they know that the rainy days, you know, there's a rainy day or bad day is going to come. And so they want that coverage. And so what's interesting, what happens that I've seen is banks will can sometimes say, hey, look, I'll lend you the whole thing. You know, we'll, we'll give you a loan for the whole amount. They always back into that, though. And so while they're, they would lend you as much as you need as long as there's that spread. And so it all oftentimes just brings it right back to where you th the amount you thought you'd get from them, call it 80% of the purchase price or what have you. So um, don't forget what it means in, in free cash, though, when I talk about this. So when you got a business that has a million in, in cash flow, you know, that, that number could be higher possibly if you think about it because, uh, or if you got a million in, uh, yeah, if you got a million in cash flow because just the, while the percentage is still that 135%, there's a lot more dollars available. And I'm saying that more for the low volume firms. Let's say you've only got 60,000 in cash flow and you want to use this 135%. Well, when you're done at the end of the day, that's only like $2,000 of free cash a month, and maybe your average sales 5,000. That's not good. So, my point is that on the bigger, on the smaller businesses, that ratio you need more spread is the point. And consequently, that's why you pay less typically for smaller businesses. You, know, you assume how much people, how money people have down, and you know that the bank will lend you only so much, and you need so much free cash available. So, I bring that up. So. The one thing I always say about this is that for all of us that have existing businesses, if a bank, and we know banks are the ones that, you know, they give you an umbrella and then it rains and they ask for it back, you know, that's a bank, typically. So the question is, if a bank's that scared, you know, if a banks are like that and they're comfortable with giving you money with this spread, most of you don't have that type of amount of debt. Uh, you know, at times I, I run into people that have a coverage that's way, you know, they got good spread, but they're complaining about cash flow. And so, you know, the first thing I ask them is I said, uh, you still going to those Cleveland Brown games? Uh, you're, you know, you still paying, you know, uh, your children out of there and really just funny education? You know, the question is to kind of look within and really decide whether or not maybe you're not making some of your own tough decisions before you affect things like advertising, you know, things that are really important to the business, okay? So capital expenditures as well, uh, this gets really important with cemeteries, but just remember there are some things, as much as we all want to make sure these expenses are going to fall in these P&Ls for tax purposes, there are some things that just don't hit the P&L for you know, new roofs or the improvements in the building. And so when you're buying a business, especially when you get into very large size businesses, there's a material amount that might not be hitting that P&L that you're sitting here listening to me trying to get this cash flow figured out. And they've got 200000 every year they spend and just doing improvements at the various locations. So make sure you're capturing that as well. And uh, those are balance sheet things, but quite honestly, I, you can kind of figure them out yourself. I mean, creating a budget at your own businesses. I, I, there, a couple of our clients uh, have, with multiple locations, they have a budget every year of 200000 That So they figure the cash flow out, and then they figure out how much is going to be allocated towards new carpet at this location. They're kind of on a rotation at their locations, either it be a roof or a carpet or what have you. And keeping that rotation going uh, and keeping those facilities up, of course, that impacts value you know, positively, of course. So creating the savings plan. So things to consider, you know, at the end of the day, you want to make sure you validate, validate it to a tax return. If somebody's uh, typically think that you'd want to reduce that cash flow as much as you can on a tax return, so it'd be interesting to compare what you've come up with with what they report to the IRS. All right, a comprehensive re employee review in the order of your own business or buying one, you know, how, how will it run going forward? Is there enough staff? You know, what's the benefit programs look like? And uh, again, we're, we're drawn on experiences here, so I'd look at you inside your own business first and say, how does, how does that look for me? You know, five to 10 years from now. Now, 
so some final comments on this acquisition thing. The uh, uh, you know the problem is, and we run into this in Batesville. I don't know. Maybe our competitor from Batesville is here. I don't know. But you know the the question is, would we ever buy? The Batesville has two funeral homes. Would we ever buy our competitor? And uh, I think we'd maybe want to, but at the same time, maybe it's okay that we have two, maybe it's just always gonna be a two funeral home town. And uh, some of these uh, recent, we've also been involved lately in helping SCI sell the Wisconsin funeral home package, they call it. And uh, there's some funeral homes there that uh, the competitors really struggled wanting to buy because they know it's a two funeral home town. And so I can give you all this stuff. But at the same time, is it just always, is there always going to be a competitor? If you're buying it, so the one question is if you're buying it, is somebody else just going to open up a new one? And so that's obviously something to consider. Um, but some comments towards that, you know, are they a good competitor? Do we want to keep it that way? Or meaning, are they good to compete against? And then the only, only caveat to all that, because it's happened, I've sold businesses where somebody didn't want to uh, buy it and I, they had good reasons and then I sold it to a well-known popular discounter out there that's not the least expensive, they're, just li they're, they're lesser than you. And they're well known, and I, I won't say their name, but they bought the funeral home, and now that person wishes he would have bought it. If not for anything else to buy it, and then sell it to somebody he could control. <clears throat> and so that became an issue. You know, uh, so consider also what would happen, because the reality is, and I'll mention it here is, uh, in one of these slides, is that if you're buying a business, the chances are the person is, I mean, they're ready for the next part of their life, they're, they're slowing down, they're not like they were when they first bought it, or they first started in the business. And so if somebody else is gonna buy it and be like they were when they were first in there, what's, how's that gonna impact your business? So it's something to consider, um, and I, if you get anything out of this, and if you run in, if you remember what I'm saying today, just think about it, because it really could. Uh, it has impacted some great funeral homes where we just sold to a person that came in and started taking the business. So, you know, seems risky. Business is a mess. Well, the, the comment I would say is, it's a, is, you know, was it supposed to be perfect? Again, things were slowing down. There's going to be some risks there. I call it opportunity. You know, identifying what it truly is opportunity in there. You know, the owner's selling to try their interest level is, uh, is slower. And so the reality check, the, the people are interested in uh, buying because they see opportunity. That's the whole thing I mentioned. And if you don't have any opportunity available for them, that's going to impact your value. Okay, and so uh, you know, consider this as a seller as well. You know, when that time comes, again, commenting on the whole, you know, should I buy or sell? So don't be this person as well. There's another one. I've had people give us offers, and they said, uh, well, the roof is, you know, there's a hole in the roof, and they were right about all that. You know, there's a hole in the roof, and they haven't taken care of the carpet, and I'm gonna, you know, my value reflects all of that and the necessary improvements I have to make. Uh, the problem is, unless everybody's going to look at it that way, because they, people will look at that as an opportunity that they'll just start doing doing that as they get involved in the business. You know, the the fact of the matter is, the the families that were coming in there with exception to a hole in the roof. You know, if the carpet was kind of worn down or the furniture was bad, <clears throat> unfortunately, it seems like they were probably used to it. <laughs> and so, but it does provide an opportunity. There's your opportunity. You're gonna go in there and you're gonna fix those things. But if you try to fix them all at once and you build that into your value, you're, you might not get that opportunity to buy that place. And so you have to weigh those options and who you think you're competing against when you're buying a firm. And my point being, don't get too stubborn and greedy because it's probably only gonna sell one time even though we've sold quite a few, three times lately. So, are you the closest competitor? Here's a fun one. You know, you're at a severe disadvantage, unfortunately, even though you got good financial synergies, but there's the whole relationship trust issue thing, you know? And uh, egos, confidentiality, trust issues. And my point would be, well, what happens is we get people to come to us and uh, they say, hey, look, I, you know, we want to expand, uh, you know, Bob is it would be a great one. Could you send a letter to him? Don't tell him it's me, for God's sakes. You know, I don't want him to know it's me. You know, he's going to find out eventually. And so the, my point would be, and my father did a good job of this uh, at Pierce Brothers back in the day in California, if you're familiar with those firms. I mean, he, he would sit and have coffee with all, this, all the guys who were competing against him. And when that day came, they called him. 
And he bought it, you know, they had that trust and, and he was able to buy most of those firms and grow that business that way. And so the thing is, don't wait until it's finally time to sell. It's going to be hard. Start now. You know, just stop down there. You're going to blow them away. You know, hey, I just want to say hi. Don't even talk about business. You know, and just uh, try to establish that relationship. It can be hard. You got to bite your tongue and hear, you know, them talk about how great everything's are, everything is. But at the same time, it's going to help you down the road when that time comes and they want to sell or you can see what's going on. So, so let's say you bought it. <laughs> okay. Now what? And just a few comments. You know, there's lots of uncertainty in the beginning. Uh, you know, reassure that staff. Uh, be open to their processes, uh, even though there's going to be some obvious things you want to change. Try not to change everything immediately, even though there will be some obvious things again. And determine that implementation process and sequence. Uh, be strategic about it. Uh, it's real important, because I've seen people go in, they had great ideas, but as my next slide would say, as much as I thought you could say some of these guys are idiots, they might be the town's idiot. And you know, and my my point is that I've seen some people that no way, you know, people with criminal records, you know, leaving businesses, going out and starting a funeral home, and being successful. I don't know if the if oh, I'm serious too. This is this is a true story, and uh, I don't know if the community felt sorry for him because he had a bad break and wanted to help him. But you know, just be careful about some of these people and and uh, uh, what your feelings are, what they may do, and and how the community embraces them. Maybe two different things. So uh, maybe a modified role for him. I don't know. So. And then make sure you work in the gray area. That can be hard at times. You know, acquisition final thoughts. One of the things we do, if, as much as I've told you all this, you know, some of the best deals you do are the ones you don't do. You know, and so, but you won't really know what that answer is unless you know your business first and you're prepared. All right, that's that's the acquisition side. And um, I want to get into the sell side, but I want to see if you guys uh, have any questions that relate to the buying side of things. Any questions on that? It's a lot of information, but yeah. All right, so multiples. I was waiting for somebody to ask that question. So they really vary, but let's, uh, when you're talking about with the real estate included right now, uh, if you used five and a half to six and a half times that cash flow, depending on the size of your business, you'll probably be close. Six and a half, anything over six, you're starting to get into areas where it's a larger size business. Uh, the multiples actually have been much higher than that, to be quite honest, with the SCI stuff we've sold, but those are some unique situations. So I think if you used an average of six times, you'd be pretty close. In yeah. the heyday, the multiples were like 11, 12, 13, sometimes yeah. 14, 15. Yeah. Well, so yeah. That was. My father can tell you all about that when he sold his. <laughs> yeah. It, the, what he was saying was the multiples were even much higher than that back in the day. So, yes. Earlier, someone asked you about the Rearrangements. Yeah. My wife and I went through a disability buyout of our apartment. Mm. Um, I forced the issue that that was a liability yeah. and not an asset. Mm -hmm. You didn't come back to your. Oh, I will. No, the slide's coming up. Absolutely, because that's always a question. And uh, I would say it's an asset and a liability, but I'll explain why and, and how that's in the, based on the value. Yep. The question was about pre needs and uh, how that contributes to value and how you look at them, especially. If you're in a state that has, if you're, God for bless, if you're still servicing NPS, which I've, we have clients that are, and some other, you know, these uh, insurance products out there where there's been tremendous shortfalls at times, and I could tell you how to kind of look at that. Other questions on this buying part of this? Are you going to touch on uh, net income? Yes. Well, uh, net income, not so, it'll all be on the EBITDA portion. So net income's mixed in there, if that's uh, what the question is. Net income, eight, what would that be? Probably eight to 15%, somewhere around there, eight to 10%. Net income, the question was, what percent do you see on net income? And the only caveat to that is you got depreciation and amortization impacting that, and that's different at every firm. If you fully depreciated your building and what have you, but eight, I, I'm saying eight to 15% of net sales could be in that range. So the liability, with the pre needs liabilities would be if you've got guarantees on there, among other things. <clears throat> yeah, in fact, what I'll do, w the slide's there, but I'll address that now. So the, the pre-needs, I had somebody call me and, and uh, wants to buy a business that uh, is servicing uh, pre-needs that were written that the company went out of business. And uh, so they're shortfalls. And so the first thing you have to look at when you're looking at a business and, and you want to buy it, 
and there's pre-need in there, and there, if, especially if there's pre-need that was from a company that went out of business and their shortfalls, the, the first question I want to see is how long ago did that happen? If that happened recently, then we know that that 25, we're saying, I'm going to use 25%, for example. So 25% of our pre-need volume is turning at need on an annual basis. So what we're saying is, uh, what I, my point would be, if, they, if that pre-need company just went out of business, there's a lot of shortfalls, we got an issue of understanding really what the true cash flow is of that business for the 25% that are coming due. Now, contra to contrast that, <clears throat> let's say, it happened seven to ten years ago that that pre-need company went out of business. <clears throat> There's a good chance that you're probably seeing the impacts of that 25% that's hitting your cash flow now. And so my point is when you're doing that uh, sales contract analysis and you're getting your sales, it's got those shortfalls in those sales for that 25% that comes due. And so when you're getting down to your cash flow, it's reflected in there. All right, now this is assuming that you've been servicing these shortfalls for a period of time. We like to trend, when we create a budget, we like to use three to four years worth of financial statements. So if you know for a fact in, your own, in this business you're looking for that three to four years have serviced the, the same shortfalls and it's gonna be like that going forward, you're buying that business based on those shortfalls. And the, the, so you're basically, you're essentially paying less. So if there was an average sale loss of 2,000 because of those shortfalls, it's in there. The good news is, eventually you would like to think, and I would, it can only be logical that it would happen, is that those shortfalls are going to fall off as that pre that because you're not going to use that company anymore, so that business is going to wear off. And when it does, it's naturally, just by the law of mathematics, if nothing else, is going to increase your average sale because you're not dealing with those shortfalls. And so the nice part is you've bought the business with the shortfalls and the business value is going to be increased and, and that's all your benefit. So, but the problem occurs, let's say it just happened yesterday and you want to sell a business. Well, what I need to do now to address those pre-needs to figure out how that impacts value is I need to do that sales contract analysis. I need to figure out how much of that were, were those pre-needs, in more particular, how much were those pre-needs were from this company that went out of business and what's the new average sale going to look like and reconstruct my sales. I know the expenses are all going to stay the same and uh, the costs and everything else. So once I've done that, I'm, what I'm looking for is that cash flow, what it should be with those shortfalls, and then that's what I'm going to pay. And so the, uh, if the pre-need book of business is $10 million or the pre-need book of business is 500000 the fact of the matter is whatever co is coming due is what, you're, is what you're giving people credit for. It's at 25%. And the rest th it, there is... Uh, you would hope would stay when you when somebody buys it or if you bought the business, but the fact of the matter is it could move, I would suppose. In most states, you can move a pre-need from one business to the other if you want, and so you're only going to buy what that average is that's coming due every year, all right? And so it's definitely, there's, an, there's the asset point of the 25% of, the of that that's coming in. And then, of course, there's the liability portion and, and knowing uh, what those liabilities, basically what those shortfalls are by doing a sales contract analysis is very important. So <clears throat> if they're not something to be scared about. In fact, for me, because I, you know, understanding sales contract analysis and how to trend out sales and, and look at the impacts on cash, I see it as an opportunity because this person has no choice but to sell you a business that has lesser cash flow because of those shortfalls. And so as long as I identify what those impacts are, if I can even just maintain the call volume, it's going to be worth more in the future because I'm going to wear off those pre-needs and the average is going to go up naturally. So it's kind of interesting thing to look at. I don't know if that answered you know, the question of you know, figuring out those pre-needs. So. <clears throat> so now let's address two and three on the crystal ball question. So you think your business may be less or maintain value and you weren't quite sure you liked all the answers that you saw. Uh, and, and so let's talk about lessons we've learned from selling a business and how you can look at that in buying or in succession plans. So getting your house in order. Uh, your fi financial preparedness. What people want to see, as you can only imagine, again, because you're dealing with opportunity and risk, they want to see clean, understandable financials, and they want to be, they want to easily be able to find the detail associated with them. So, 
I can't stress enough how much you should have good, clean accounting being done at your firm, so that when somebody looks at it, they don't, you know, what what happens is that, you know, if you think about a mental column, every time they see something that kind of throws a question up, they're kind of marking over here, and it's impacting the multiple negatively. They're saying, well, uh, you know, they're not able to show me the detail to these revenues, and so this is that's not good, and the payroll, uh, it's not matching, and they don't have an answer to that. That's not good. And so as much as it can all be good where they can match all that, it impacts the value of your firm. And so have good, clean, understandable data to provide when people want to see it, especially for yourself as you're running the business. You know, you want to be able to make good decisions when you're making a budget and what have you. So prepare your P&L, good income and expense trends. Uh, prove clearly the cash flow that's available, which is going to be readily apparent if you've got good, clean financial statements. Have your receivables control and order. Expense management, personal expenses. You just want good detail, again, and good record keeping. So how many people have had, like, evaluation done on their business out there? Gotcha. All right. Any of the businesses that we've sold where the, our client was getting evaluation done, I mean, five years out before they even considered selling, by the time it got time to sell, they knew exactly what they were going to get. They had their tax plan ready. Uh, they, uh, had, they had the trends in place that made the buyers excited about it. Uh, they uh, cut expenses where they knew it was, you know, they were kind of pairing off, you know, toning down some expenses where they knew the buyer wouldn't see any value of it and would just cancel it anyway. And so by the time they got where they wanted to sell, it was, they did very well. And so, you know, evaluation, getting evaluation done doesn't mean you want to sell your business. Getting evaluation done is finding out what the mo your most valuable asset is worth today and figuring out how to maintain or grow that value. It's just a good exercise. And it's uh, one of those things that whether it's evaluation or when we help people buy and sell in our experiences, you're always going to learn something from it because you're going to find out what people liked and didn't like about your business. And, uh, and if you had to sell then, You'd be kicking yourself saying, boy, if I knew that five years ago, I could have made some of those changes. That's crazy. I did, that, that seems easy to me. So consider that. And then how does each location add value? That's that whole thing with the scaled down economies or economies of scale, you know, and the Pareto principle, if you're familiar with that. I mean, is it an 80-20 rule where some of these locations are taking 80% of your time and really contributing about 20% of what you want? You know, figure that part out because a buyer might. And or maybe that'll be you as the buyer and you get all that value out of that. So. There's the pre-need slide for pre-need fulfillment average versus at-need average, pre-need funds, shortfall, what's their value? We talked about that, right? And make your firm worth more. Uh, I have a study group that I'm a part of, and uh, the biggest thing we talk about is call volume trend. Uh, it seems like in the world of funeral service, uh, if you've got a good call volume trend or good stability in your call volume, you can fix most other evils in a way. And so if you were going to use one benchmark, it would be great to see where your call volume has been in the last 10 years. I wouldn't do the last three or five. I mean, you'll see a better trend 10 or even further out. And uh, seeing how you can address that. At our own funeral homes, uh, when we have our meetings, we, we take into consideration what's that one church or religious place where we just never get a call. How can we just get one call? Out of them. You know, what is that? And we kind of brainstorm it and what have you. You know, calls, and I'm going to get to the end and show you, but calls really bring a lot of value to your business. And I, I want to show you just how much value at the end here because it's pretty revealing. And if your staff could see it, they'd probably, some of them would feel a little embarrassed about how they contribute to your firm. Okay? So, How's the business? Is it running well without you? Our employees are, uh, here's a big one. I've seen people build up a lot of value in their business, and then uh, they, as they were starting to slow down, they didn't put their key guy in their employment agreement. They started taking them around town, introducing them to all the relationships that the person had as an owner. And then it got time to sell, and this is a true story. And uh, the key employee, you know, they wanted to give them a chance, and the business is worth conservatively $4 million in this case, and the key employee said, hey, look, I'm not going to pay more than two and a half. You know, if you don't want to sell to me, I'll just start a new location. I know everybody in town now. And so here's a, this family had a lifetime of work involved with the value of their most precious asset that really was worth $4 million. And uh, you had, uh, you know, the next generation in there, basically they'd not tied down, gave them all the keys to the kingdom, and now he's impacting the value by a million and a half. I mean, that's, you know... <laughs> 
I don't want to hear what some people would do to address that, but uh, the fact of the matter in this case, somebody bought that at a lesser value, and he did go and open up, and he did take a lot of volume out of that business, and that was a shame. You know, but the owner kind of allowed that to happen, and that's a it's a difficult thing that we have to deal with because you go into, man, you know, you hear management consultants say, you know, empower the next generation and this and that, but we're all faced with an interesting thing with the relationships we have in our community and how we share those, and so it's it's not easy. I give you that, you know, uh, but you know. It, Possibly it's an employment agreement, you know, maybe uh, giving them a little stake in the ownership so they uh, do what's best for you going forward, what have you. Something there to make sure that they're on board. Uh, creating a franchise name in the market. Competing well against competition. Some of the, we've had some businesses uh, where two million revenue out of one loca great location and uh, the, in the value was impacted because uh, as proud as they were of not having any competitor in town, every buyer said, well, there's gonna be one. And so it really impacted the value, and what are you going to do about it? I mean, ask somebody to open up, you're not going to do that, but just know that if you don't have a competitor in town, uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, it has impacted value. And what's really good, what buyers really want to see, is that you've got a good competitor in town and that you compete well against them. Uh, so you, the risk is a little low and that somebody else is going to open up at that point, and so meaning that you've got good future in the market. So. Strong revenues, consistent average sales, succession in place, we talked about that, property location, path of progress, we talked about functionality location, personnel uh, mix, you know, what's the age of the employees and the staff. You know, basically, the, uh, make sure your life expectancy looks good and, and your value should be good. So we get, ironically, we get the most money f for selling uh, businesses when it's not time to sell. And basically, there's no reason for you to sell. You're doing well. Well, obviously, everybody would like that. And so, you know, you get good value out of that. And so when you're doing that crystal ball thing, you kind of wonder if it's five years from now. Maybe, maybe now's the time, you know, or consider that when you're looking at another business. So time to sell, yes. Outside buyer, no. So succession planning. Uh, so we're talking about selling, but we're talking about uh, internal transfers. And uh, I can reflect on this well just in, in going through this with my father. It's uh, not always the same experience for all. You know, one person wants something and the other, they both want something, if you will. But uh, the sobering point is that you know, great funeral directors don't necessarily make, funeral service people don't necessarily make great arrangers, and which don't make great managers, which don't make great owners. And so uh, that's a tough one to deal with. And my question is, how are you de dealing with uh, you know, getting them uh, educated in that next level? Because again, I, I've met some great arrangers that were just terrible, man terrible managers. You know, they just they actually enjoyed doing the arrangements more. So, which was good. So, are you addressing these issues with these capabilities in your firm if you're considering succession plans? And uh, are you working yourself out of a job? I was like this. This will throw your staff off. Um, uh, when I was working at uh, a cemetery uh, out in Nevada, um, my people could never understand why I was sitting there showing them everything I could do and, and uh, letting them work with me and, and learn what I could do. They, they looked at me like I was crazy. The fact of the matter was, for me, at least within that organization, uh, it allowed me to move to the next level. And so sometimes people get real secure on, uh, you know, and hold that stuff in. And uh, I know we're faced with how much knowledge you want to share with some of these people, at least with our marketing ties. But you know, develop, developing that staff, if you want a succession plan in place, I mean, what's more, you know, what could be more, more rewarding than getting the value of your business and transferring it to the people that, were, that allowed you to get there? You know, but, but you got to start developing them because if it, it gets to the end, uh, it's going to be a difficult thing for them. And so job redundancy is what I love to call it. So keeping all the secrets in the community, what type of commitment does the key personnel and family member have? Uh, there's a story that I heard that was funny. And uh, it was a guy that, uh, uh, father that uh, he gave the business actually as a gift to his son. He was really excited about it. It was kind of the next stage. His son was going to pay him a uh, salary. And uh, as, the, as, the, as the year went on, you know, the, father, the son was put in there to be a manager. I mean, it really wasn't doing much before. Put him in there as a manager. And they had to have a meeting about three months into it. And he sat down with his son. He said, you know, I'm excited for you. You got the business now. And me and your mom are doing more things. But I'm noticing you're not managing. You're not doing what you need to do to manage a place. And, the son said, uh, well, you know, Dad, I, I don't know that I really like this managing thing. You know, it's not really for me. You know, it's neat to be the owner, but uh, I don't want to do that. He said, well, I'll tell you what. Why, why don't we put you and be an arranger. I'll step in a little more and be the manager. You do this arrangement. So they both agreed and they went off. 
So three months goes by, and the father looks, and he notices the son's not doing arrangements. He's just kind of, you know, arra- you know, family comes in, he gives it to somebody else. So they have another meeting. And so they, you know, he says, you know, I'm not seeing you doing the arrangements. I'm stepping in now. I'm doing the managing. I've had to do some of your arrangements. You know, uh, I'm excited that you, you're now the owner, but we've got to have you doing something. So how about we get you in the prep room? We do some of that. I said, okay, I'll try that. Yeah. You know where this is going. So three months goes by, and uh, he's not seeing him in there. The father's starting to do some of the embalming now, too. He wasn't doing that. He wasn't even doing that before he sold it, you know, to his son. And they sit down, and the, the, uh, the, he says, son, you know, I'm basically back involved in this business, and I don't see you doing any of these things. And the son said, you know, I really thought about this, and I think you need to buy me out. So anyway. Uh, Anyway, don't let that happen. So employment agreement, CNC, covenant not to compete. Uh, just as a quick rule of thumb, we see covenant not to compete to be uh, uh, over 10 to 15 years. Uh, it's an important piece in a funeral home acquisition because you guys all have good contacts in the community and you, as a new buyer, you don't want that former owner going out and, and taking that business from you because it's very, they're very capable of doing it. And so, as a portion of the purchase price, and, and as a note, when I talk about these multiples, that includes everything. That includes uh, the uh, the covenant not to compete. In particular, it includes the covenant not to compete and the cash that you're providing to the owner. It's all in that that six times, if you will. And some buyers more day more more so nowadays because of what happened back. God bless them in the low end days where they started not paying some of these CNCs. Uh, it's all cash, but there is a covenant not to compete portion in there. So uh, just to be aware of that. And then, uh, how? so the bigger thing, just like with the experience with the son, but let's say he was buying that, you know, uh, how, are they, how are you preparing them to pay for that business? You know, I have a guy who showed me a picture of the Nile River, you know, say, I, you know Nile River, where we're at. He said, that's the Nile River. He said, this is denial. Denial is not a river in Egypt. He said, make sure, his point was just make sure, you know, you, that uh, you're not setting people up and you've done all this training for them, but there's no way they're going to be able to pay for it. You know, and so whatever that means, we have some clients that have ESOP programs where they're kind of transferring some of the business over over time and uh, shares. Um, it's kind of a difficult thing to do, but there's, that's one way or having the, you know, selling some uh, small portions uh, to the key staff over time that they pay fair value for that. Um, all kinds of ways. So valuation for both of you to consider when you're doing this for the father and son. So when you're Sitting down, we have valuations right now. The, the father's ready to sell to the son. The son wants to buy. Um, <clears throat> the way we do it, the way I think that's fair, is the son needs to see what the father could get in the market, and the father needs to see what the son's cash flow is going to be, which is going to be different than what the outside might expect. So there, you know, there might be expenses that outside buyer might not consider, and the son's going to have to have them. And so it's only fair that they need to see both sides. So I, I really, I put two columns up, and I say, you know, somewhere in the middle is the fair thing for the value of this business for, for you guys, you know. And uh, as I say, uh, you know, you want to start on it now, but the reality is, and I learned this out of my, my own transfer, is that my parents felt like they were going to live forever, and uh, they're certainly used to what the cash flow was today, and they didn't really want to change, although they wanted, they knew they needed to transfer it. And for me, you know, I want to conquer the free world, and I just, you know, I, I want to pay as little as I can, and so, you know, finding that happy medium. And uh, for us, an interesting part of this development of that succession plan was first for my father to really, to realize kind of what is a fair cash flow for him to live off of. You know, as you kind of get happy with your status within your ownership of a funeral home, we have some luxuries that we take and, and that we use. And, and uh, when you want to consider selling, especially to your, your son or your key employees, we have to be reasonable on what is a fair amount of uh, living standards for us. We should, you know. We, we deserve to live pretty good because we worked hard, but uh, just consider uh, you know, whether or not, uh, for my father, was smoking cigars. He realized he probably should quit smoking cigars. It was costing a lot of money. So anyway, I don't even say how much that was, but he smoked about four a day. So uh, just how important is all this? And this is the wrap up to this. So impacts value study of buying and selling. So people will call and say, you know, I want to understand the value of my firm. I'm a 500 call firm. You know, you, you can you give me an idea and value? And so there's some sample firms here. 
Uh, you got business one where it's 450, 510, 500, 495, 500. Business two has a downward kind of trend and business three has an upward trend. Just what our experience has seen is that either, you know, certainly business one seems to be more like a 500 call firm. Business three could be 500, heck it could be a 550 call firm. But again, when you're trying to sell a business, uh, when people are looking at it and what are the prospects of what the volume is going to be the next year, you know, they have to take that in consideration. And it really just speaks to having a, a good volume trend and certainly not having one where you've got a downward trend. And, and what I've, how I've seen some people correct those downward trends is simply by looking at the, if they had multiple locations, they took the one that was causing it and they sold it or they, met, you know, they joined it together or something, got rid of it. They, they, you know, that trend was impacting the perception of the, of the entire business. So not all the same have the same value. Have a good trend. Uh, be working on it now. And, it, and don't let it be too late. You know? So scenario two, I'm going to, I'll explain all these. I'm flipping them up on the board here. So what I'm going to talk about real quick with the remaining time we've got is a firm that's got an average sale of $4,500. And this, this would be, uh, I've had a lot of people ask for these slides just to show their arrangers, uh, you know, as an example of how they impact, you know, the value of that firm. So we're going to talk about a firm with a $4,500 average sale, budgeted calls of 500 calls, uh, so the revenue is $2,250,000. Uh, we're going to assume that the cost of goods with some other miscellaneous costs are 22%, uh, okay? So we're going to use a cash flow EBITDA, that EBITDA number again of 30%. So we've got a cash flow of EBITDA using that 30% of 675,000. We're gonna do a six time multiple. And so we're gonna talk about a business that has $4 million in value. You all can see that and follow that, all right? So let's say you grow, considering all those uh, uh, scenarios, let's say you grow, you're able to grow your call volume by 10 more calls. So if we're using a $4,500 average sale, that's 45,000. We're going to say the cost is 22%, assuming that you didn't have to spend any more in advertising or payroll, uh, other GNA, all those vehicles, things like that. We're going to say that the profit for those calls was 78%. Okay, and so we're talking about 35,000 in profit off those calls, and we're trading at six times. And so, interestingly enough, I mean, I don't know how much we th you think about it this way. But if you do have an average sale of 4,500, you can bring 10 more calls, and the only thing you're going to have to pay for is your merchandise. The day you want to sell or transfer, and if the buyer thinks you really have those 10 more calls, they're going to give you an extra $200,000. That's pretty cool. Okay. Now, <laughs> if you lose 10 calls, it's the same thing. All right. I don't want to stop there because this is my presentation. So let's say it was 20 calls. You know, let's say it was 30 calls. I mean, this is, uh, you know, you look at it from, I'm, it's just an interesting perspective when you use multiples of the compounding and the impacts of positive growth and negative growth within a funeral home, okay? So think about that, because it is real. And uh, here's another way to look at it. So a negative survey, how many people survey their families in here? I hope all of you do, you should, right? Okay, so let's say you get a negative survey, it happens, okay? And you follow it up, you tried everything you could, they're not coming back, right? And they're just going to stop using you, so you've lost a call. And let's say, we're not going to blame it on us, let's say it was one of your arrangement staff. They had a bad day, and uh, the family and just didn't take care of that family, and so you've lost that family. So think about it this way, and you show this to a funeral ranger, you know, I would imagine they'd sit up a little straighter in their chair, figuring out how they're not going to let that happen again. Let's say you lose one call in the $4,500 average sale. And uh, you know, we were talking about the profit that you would have had off that. So it's $3,500. And let's say you're trading it six times. So they just lost $20,000 in value at your firm, right? Because they had a bad day and, uh, or didn't get it or, or whatever, and that family's not coming back. And so what I always ask somebody is, what would happen? And, and think about this when you're buying a firm, too, if you can grow but, uh, you know, or reverse these type of trends. But what happened if, like, your employee came in and lost $20,000 today? I'm pretty sure I know what you'd do and involve the police and probably firing and a whole bunch of other things. And, you know, you know, we don't look at it that way when we lose a call and we think about And you certainly want to build on how you can, you know, not let that happen again. But this, can ha this does happen. I mean, so it's an interesting perspective, I'll, I'll call it that way, since we're doing these extra exercises. And so average sale impacts on value. Let's say if you can average, you know, you can add $100 more on 500 calls. And think about this if you were buying a firm and you didn't pay for it, 
you know, with this growth, but you were able to achieve this growth. So $100 more on those 500 calls, 50,000 in growth. There's no more, there's probably not gonna be any additional costs, right? It probably fall to the bottom line, trading it six times. So this is why we always talk about ranger training and average sale growth and what have you. Uh, you, grow, you grow your average sale by a sustainable $100 and you've added 300,000 in value to firm. We don't look at it that way, you know, but when you do, it does kind of talk about the importance of it because I can tell you, all I'm reflecting on in these slides is what everybody experiences when we sell their firm and they realize what they didn't do that they could have done that got them more, would have gotten them more value. Or when they were buying a firm, what they were gonna do, which was gonna get them more value, you know? So the problem is, because I have to show this, this is my presentation, is if you're losing $100 in average sale, the same thing's happening. But I didn't want to stop there. What if you're losing $150 in average sale? What if you're losing $200 in average sale? These are all realities that you're not faced with until that day comes you want to transfer it or sell it. All right, And certainly they're positive if you're buying and you can, you can do the opposite of that. So. Let's think about, uh, finally, to conclude, let's think about uh, arrangers. You've got, we all do that sales contract analysis, but let's say you do it by a ranger. You've got a ranger one providing a $4,800 average sale, and you've got a ranger two doing a $4,200 average sale. And uh, if you run down these scenarios, use that same hypothetical uh, scenario. You've got one adding a million, almost a million three in value to you because they get it, they understand, you know, they, they like you, I don't know what it is, and the other one's just that grumpy guy and that slide, and he's only adding a million one thirty in value. And so the, the question is, I would wonder whether or not the one, because maybe he's just the older guy, just w wasn't up to change, is getting compensated more, but he's adding less in value to your firm. And uh, you know the fact that Arranger A was adding more value, it kind of speaks at least to a, a, a scenario of just seeing how, um, how you know some of you that experience or do incentive programs, just you know why maybe you would do those. So anyway, as I say, you know there's people making things happen, wonder, you know, watching things happen and wondering what's happening, and so you know be the first one, make things happen. There's a lot of things to consider when you're buying and selling, and uh, especially in the success succession plan, and certainly how the impacts of those average sales are. So there he is again. So what you're going to do about it? And that's it. So any question, you know, if you, any questions on that? It's a lot of information. Again, the slides will be available for you. What do you see happening in the next five to ten years with acquisitions? Hmm. Well, I think as the the question was, what do we see happening in the next five to ten years with acquisitions? I think with uh, the way the cremation rate's going, I think as these smaller firms will continually be squeezed, and they're going to have to con merge or consolidate, um, or you know buy another firm, sell, what have you. That, so it's gonna impact, I mean, the smaller firms would be, you know, you would think you could see some impact there immediately. I think there's lots of opportunities out there if you're, a, you know, you're going to conferences like this and you're learning from each other and you're, you're a well-respected uh, firm in your community to grow because uh, it's getting harder and harder. And so if you've got that uh, foundation already built and you're doing all these things right here and everything that you're learning in your study groups, uh, I think the future's bright, really, you know. Because cremation, uh, while it's a risk, it's also an opportunity. You know, if you're you're addressing it. How often do you recommend valuation? Mm. We have one client. I'll tell you just how our clients do. We have one that was doing it uh, once a year, and that might be excessive. It's for their ESOP program. But I would say if you were doing it every two or three years, probably no more, no longer than five years. You know, certainly if you're, seeing, uh, if you're seeing changes or you have changes in your organization that occur in a year uh, from prior year and you want to see those impacts, you know, getting an update to that valuation is not like doing a whole new one as it relates to cost and time. So, yeah? The cost for funeral home valuation range uh, from as low as 2,500, and I've done some for as high as 10,000. Depends on the size of the firm. I'd say an average would be four or five thousand. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. I can make a comment, Jake, uh, and that is, it's worth the money. <laughs> yep. Definitely. Spend, money. spend before you spend money. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Anybody else? Good. Thank you. Thank you very much.